In honor of the just-concluded March Madness, I'm back with my good friend and colleague Jason Meyer for our annual Ethics Madness podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. And as you know, it's March. And more importantly, it's March Madness. And the best thing about March Madness is I get to get together with my good friend, Jason Meyer, to do Ethics Madness. So, Jason, welcome to 2023. My bracket's busted. I have no distractions. Yeah, welcome to Ethics Madness 2023. It's uh, it's great to be back for this this joint production of the Eight Mindsets podcast and the Compliance Podcast Network. Tom, great to see you again. My my bracket looks terrible, but uh, there there is one thing that matters to me that's still alive, and I'm wearing my colors. My Princeton Tigers are still alive. Exactly. Um, at least as of the time we're recording this uh, on on Wednesday, going into the uh, going into the Sweet Sixteen weekend. Um, but you know, for for the uninitiated, uh, this is you know this is like a mostly annual event for Tom and I. It's it's our excuse to sort of talk trash about ethics and sports, and to use sports as an allegory to talk about ethics and compliance, and maybe to see what lessons. Uh, the sort of world of corporate ethics and compliance, and for that matter, higher education ethics and compliance, uh, you know, like what lessons can we gather from what's happened in the sports world that has wrangled Tom and I <laughs> over the last year, right? Great to so, see you, man. And as usual, the sports world has not failed to disappoint. Oh, no. Uh, no. And so we, what do you we, got? Well, we what usually start with it? basketball, right? Because this is this okay. is the season of basketball. So oh, it's you know, bad. it's March mm-hmm. Madness, and there's there is some ethics madness happening there. And and the first thing, Tom, to get me is the University of Alabama Crimson Tide, which you know is known as a football power, but this year uh, has a number one seed team in uh, the NCAA Men's Championships. Um, but there's something else about that. It's a really good team, but there's something else about that team. Uh, which is two of its starting players, Brandon Miller, who is the team's top star, maybe college player of the year, uh, and another starter, Jaden Bradley. Well, the for you, early in the season, it turned out they were both present at a shootout, a shootout that led to someone's death, the death of a man named Jamea Harris. Uh, they were both present at earlier activity. This shootout was like in the, in like two, three o'clock in the morning. Earlier that evening, they were both present at a verbal confrontation, which escalated and maybe most damning. Uh, it was Brandon Miller, the star player, who brought the fatal gun to the scene, handed it to a friend who handed it to the eventual shooter. Uh, there are still a lot of unanswered questions about this. Uh, The university is kind of minimizing the whole thing. Alabama's head coach is not even talking about it. No charges have been leveled. But it's some, you know, some way you look at this, maybe not technically, but you've got two starting players who played a role in a murder. And maybe to make matters worse, uh, Brandon Miller, the star player, has this little routine he did when he was introduced to the crowd at the beginning of games where he uh, was, you know, he was part of a pantomime of being patted down for a weapon. That was like his show of, of cool or strength. So not very cool activity on the part of Alabama. Public outrage finally ended Brandon Miller's pregame routine. You know, did they break a rule? Not clear. Did they break a law? There are no charges yet, but it's sort of setting tone at the top goes. Uh, This was not great and has led to a lot of criticism of Alabama. So, Tom, my question for you is, you know, one more example of can you love the art but not the artist? Can you love the play of Alabama's basketball team, but maybe not to be so crazy about the player or the way they approach the situation? So I'm a Southerner. If this was Alabama football, I would completely understand it. But it's not Alabama football. It's Alabama basketball. (laughs) And this has been a series of missteps by Alabama, by its players, by its university president, its board of trustees, obviously the basketball coach. And if you are thinking about drafting Brandon Miller, 
you have to consider this behavior um, because of what it may lead to. Uh, uh, NBA pro player named John Morant, one of the young, very top stars of the NBA, uh, got into some serious trouble and to the point where it may cost him $39 million for brandishing a gun at a men's club. And unfortunately, when you brandish a gun, the uh, they get used a whole lot more if they're brandished than if they're left at home. Yeah. And um, so here we had uh, actually a couple of things. One, uh, there was a murder charge uh, filed against the shooter. So there have been some charges filed. But um, Alabama has just completely fumbled this. The pat-down routine that you mentioned was just absolutely catastrophic. The coach, his explanation now withdrawn was, oh, he was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. Well, you correctly noted he actually got the gun and brought it to the scene and at the request of the eventual shooter. So some serious missteps in judgment from Brandon Miller. Um, Alabama. I think, I think Alabama football, you know, whatever you want to say about it, I think their legendary coach has a little bit sen- better sense of what public leadership looks like. <laughs> And a I, lot better. I would, I would like to think he wouldn't have gone that way on, on, uh, on this play. Um, but it, it, you know, it leaves a bad taste in the mouth for what is a number one seed. It got the number one seed anyway. And I, you know, I didn't hear a lot of criticism for the, N, for the NCAA because ultimately on what basis are they supposed to seed the teams? I, I do have sort of a personal ethics question, which is, um, should I feel guilty that I put the tide in my bracket? Uh, and I ultimately found that I was not able to carry them all the way to the final four. Uh, number one, because I thought, you know, I think this is going to be a distraction and take them down. Number two, because I want my bracket to be different than other people's brackets. So number three, it was just like, there comes a point where like, I do not want to be rooting for this team. And all three are valid. So uh, I just, uh, everything has been done wrong by Alabama in this. Uh, You see, I think you see in this how important it is for employees, excuse me, corporations to really look at their employees that they promote. And I won't speak for you, but I made some serious misjudgments of error when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And long after that, um, so I understand that, but um, people who do things like that tend to keep doing things like that. And that's what gets corporations in trouble when they bring on employees who can either have a certain moral flexibility, depending on the circumstances, or feel like the rules don't apply to them, period. And I don't know which, if either of those apply here, but it, it certainly gives me pause to wonder who would want someone of that character associated with their brand? Yeah. And, and sort of the lack of remorse, the lack of apology, the lack of understanding of the gravity of the situation, you know, this wasn't, this wasn't just like, you know, uh, you know, I caroused too hard. Probably he'd been, if it, if it had been a matter of carousing too hard, the team probably would have penalized him for that. Um, and somehow, you know, uh, being a, handing the gun to the murderer basically uh, we're supposed to laugh that off so you know certainly a lesson here about what what you project publicly but you have raised another point which takes me to another topic which is okay we have indiscretions in our past you know sometimes we have ethical missteps in our past at what point should someone be redeemed for that and and this year in sports we have well, we have a lot of examples of that, but but two come to mind. One is from the tournament. Uh, so Rick Pitino, uh, the, a peripatetic Hall of Fame coach, a great basketball coach. I, I have rooted for teams because Pitino was their coach. He's been the head coach of Kentucky, the New York Knicks, the Boston Celtics, Providence University, Boston University, and uh, most recently, Iona, which he it's a small school from a small conference. They won their bid. He brought them to the to the tournament. Uh, I had them in my bracket, and they lost 
they did not upset in the first round. And promptly after losing in the first round, Rick Pitino announced that he would be going to a school with to, to going to uh, St. John's, which is in the ACC and much more likely to get a tournament bid, even if they don't win their conference tournament. Um, this is uh, leaving after a short time Iona, which as Sports Illustrated's Pat Ford put it, Iona had rescued Patina Patino from Grecian exile. Why was he in exile? Because his 17 years at Louisville came to an abrupt stop uh, under scandal. Uh, Ford's recap of the scandal is as good as any I'll come up with. Ford said, uh, here's the recap. A Patino staffer arranged for sex acts for players and recruits in the basketball dorm. It led to the school's self-imposing a postseason ban. It led to Louisville's 2013 National Championship being vacated, and it led to Patino being suspended by the NCAA for five games. Uh, two other staffers were found to have committed level one violations in an FBI-related case. Patino personally accepts, uh, avoided sanctions, although under current NCAA rules, not the rules in force at that time, but under current NCAA rules, Patino, as head coach, would have been held personally responsible for the errors of his staff. Footnote, see Joe Paterno and Penn State um, in terms of what's your liability for the errors of your staff. So Patino didn't do so hot from an ethics point of view. He spent some time at, out of the game. He spent some time at Iona. Now, apparently, he is redeemed goods. Um the other example of redeemed goods I'm going to mention, Tom, because I know it gets your blood going. And that would be the Houston Astros, who defeated my beloved Phillies in the World Series. Uh, after their cheating scandal of the previous decade, uh, their sign-stealing sign scandal and various other things. Uh, but now apparently the Houston Astros are okay. So the question is basically... What does it take to be redeemed for post-misconduct, past misconduct? And can you be redeemed for all past misconduct? I know you're still angry at the Strohs. So tell me what you think. So this is a, a specific question I have struggled with uh, for a long time. And we both know people in our space who went to jail for ethical violations were actually legal violations. And they paid their dues to society as defined by prosecutor in the courts of time in jail. And uh, some people say, well, that, that, that should be enough. And they may be right. That, that should be enough. On the other hand, the last example I gave about uh, Brendan Miller and now John ja Morant in basketball, um, does that type of character really put your brand at risk? Whether that brand is your corporate brand, whether it's a company or other brand or, um, Nike with um, Kanye West, the artist formerly known as Conway, Conway, Kanye West, I should say. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I still struggle with that question. At, at some point, um, I think forgiveness is appropriate. Um, I'm going to shout out, though, to Evan Drellick for his great book, Winning Fixes Everything, just <laughs> released. Yeah. on the Houston Astros. And what I learned in that book was two things. One was the conduct was much worse than I ever dreamed. It had one of the most toxic work environments. Employees were treated no, be no, no better than anyone else. And it was just terrible. The other thing, unfortunately, I learned was that the Astros cheated during the World Series. So um, in 2018 or 2019, I said publicly, they should return the trophy because I didn't think they won it fairly. Um, the best I can tell you is I was able to put that out of my mind last October and <laughs> fully revel in winning a world series at home. But I will say, see if I can pull it up. The absolute best thing, Jason was that my wife and I went to game one and my wife, 17 year American, are living in America, six-month U.S. citizen, catches wow. a World Series baseball. Oh, that's awesome. Now, in 60 years of going to ball games, I will give you one guess how many baseballs I've caught ever. <laughs> she 
gets a World Series baseball. So it was worth it just for that. Um, but let me, let me, I have to digress to the World Series. That was an incredible World Series. And for those who think the Astros took this or the Astros steamrolled the Phillies, it was literally a game of inches. Every game, except the game that the Phillies stomped the Astros. The, uh, the, the excitement level was incredible. Um, I wasn't really disappointed at the time Bryce Harper was in a slump, but you know, I was pulling for him because he's a, he's a face of baseball that hopefully will be with us for a long time. The play was just outstanding. Uh, pitching for the most part was just outstanding. It was as great a baseball as you could ask for. Uh, so I'm still, you're right. I'm still mad at the 2017 Astros. I'll probably always be mad at them. I'm madder now after I've read Drellick's book, but it was a complete toxic work environment. And, and the question I want to pose to him when I interview him is how did they do so well if it was such a terrible place to work? Um, so fascinating. I, that's kind of where I am. I'm yeah. Completely you know, I, I think we can, befuddled. we can look at the last at recent history and see all kinds of people who made what I think were relatively minor errors who have never been redeemed. Uh, I, I can think of, of former U S senators in that category, for example, uh, who for a youthful indiscretion, you know, are suddenly, you know, out of the political spotlight and yet sort of outright cheating at what I do is, is, you know, it's like, Oh, well, ho hum. Um, you know, what makes a difference? What do we do? How do we redeem people? I think remorse, <laughs> I think, admission that you did something wrong you you know we, we, you talked about colleagues we know who who spent the time behind, behind bars you know and they come out and they say wow i really blew it here's what i learned let me share my lessons let me make let me pull no punches about my guilt uh you know i think that's a lesson for companies coming back uh from wrongdoing i think the glass house rule certainly applies and um you know to, facing up to what you've done wrong admitting it, sharing your lessons, I think goes a long way towards us really being able to say, you know, okay, we're, we're, we're ready to move forward now. Um, you know, at another level, Tom, I, I have never been crazy about corporate zero tolerance policies uh, in part for this very reason, because, uh, you know, none of us are perfect. Um, and, and to me, there is something different about slipping up once and needing to understand something and slipping up to two, three, four, five times. And OK, maybe that's who you are. Uh, I also fear that zero tolerance just uh, thwarts reporting. It raises the stake on reporting. It means that your fellow workers know if they report on you, you're going to face the corporate equivalent of capital punishment uh, with no chance of redemption. And that will make them less likely to speak up, whereas if it you know, if it's like we'd like to help people who are wrongdoers, maybe we're more likely to get speaking up in our communities. So uh, I'm not crazy about zero tolerance policies, but I'm also not crazy about the Astros. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know where I don't know where that puts me. Um, you know, before we get yeah, we, we've got some other sports stories, but I, I, I just want to ask, like, how's your year been? We, we did this last March. We did this year ago. Like. What's been happening over the last year? You've been devoting a lot of your professional efforts, maybe most of your professional efforts, to the Compliance Podcast Network. Like, how's it going? What have you learned in the world? Like, what's your big takeaway in the world of ethics and compliance? Well, I actually have three podcast networks now. So uh, I'm really trying to see uh, what I can do with all that. And uh, here's the thing I tell people. I just sit around and talk to smart, intelligent Fun people all day. And I have two criteria. Present company podcast. accepted. Yeah, but... <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> number one, how much did I learn? And number two, how much fun did I have? Mm -hmm. If we hit 10 or 11 on those, then it's a great podcast. Yeah. So uh, I just get to talk to people all day. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I learn more because I'm consuming education. And it's given me an ability to see broader pictures because I'm talking to people uh, from uh, as disparate uh, groups as you can to see how it all sort of fits together. Um, I was on a stage at a podcast conference and someone asked me the question, 
what's hard about podcasting? And I sat there for a minute and I said, there's nothing hard about podcasting. <laughs> Try being a lawyer for 40 years. Uh, that was miserable. No, there's nothing hard about podcasting. It's just a great job to have. Well, you say, I think you sell yourself short. I mean, that's, uh, first of all, you're, you're being an entrepreneur, you're running businesses. That is to me the, the greatest mental puzzle and challenge that there is. Uh, and it is not everybody who can say, look, I, I'm, I'm ready to talk to anybody. I'll have a, I'm, I'm love having a conversation with everybody and I'll talk about any topic. And, and, uh, that is a skill. It's, it, it's, it's skill. Uh, I cherish my dad for having, he was a, a lifelong journalist. Uh, and, and I tried to learn that from him and, and, uh, you know, I think it's just great. So today, for instance, I interviewed a Ukrainian compliance professional who has uh, escaped Ukraine at the start of the war and is now in the Netherlands. And we talked about doing compliance wow. in the Netherlands. I interviewed a woman who uh, is a huge a women's basketball fan, and she wrote uh, Leadership Lessons from Pat Summit. And then I interviewed a, comp uh, a new president of a multinational or multi-billion dollar company, media company, who she just became president, and she granted me an interview about her leadership style. So it's, it's as varied as it can be. And now we're talking sports. So how much better can yeah. it be than this, Jason? How, how, much, how much better can it get? Um, yeah. Been uh, been a busy year for me and for Lead Good Education. We actually did a little rebranding this year. Uh, went from just the name Lead Good to Lead Good Education to, to underline uh, the role we're playing in our consulting work that we, we focus on helping education programs and compliance and ethics education programs within companies and, and helping the education sector with its compliance. Um, been loving doing the, the eight mindsets podcast with the great and uh, Nicole Rose is just, you know, so creative uh, always, always brings a different perspective to what's going on. Always opens my eyes to things. And, and uh, we're doing work under the eight mindsets uh of trying to bring those ideas uh, to other ethics compliance teams and help them do in-house uh, what they're doing um, and spending more time uh, and more attention now helping organizations with including and engaging uh, with uh, the neurodivergent people in their workforces and trying to involve mm -hmm. those workers in ethics compliance. And that's, that's been fascinating work as well. So it's, it's been a great year. And another year where I'm thankful for something that ties us back into sports. Um, and, and the sports story for me, maybe speaking of redemption, is Kansas coach Bill Self. Uh, Kansas has been under some heat. They have tried to, uh, I think, recover from, from their NCAA violations. Uh, another strong team, but they're out this year. And they were eliminated in the tournament only a couple of weeks after Bill Self underwent a fairly emergency uh, cardiac treatment for the implantation of stents. Uh, a few years ago, been there, done that. Um, uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, 150 points of cholesterol and, and 50 pounds of weight ago for me. Uh, it was... A turning point in my life and it was a lesson in compliance for me um you know i have to say on a very personal level uh i learned the difference between sort of complying like sort of complying with what i ought to be eating sort of doing exercise uh and more perfect compliance and i'm um you know i'm not perfect in my diet but i'm uh i'm pretty close and i work at it every day and i get a reward and the reward is I feel great. I'm doing strong. Uh, I think Bill Self will get the reward of, uh, you know, many, many more years of successful coaching. Um, and it's just, you know, to me, it was, uh, Tom, it, it's, it was just a, a real personal lesson, again, in the difference between thinking you're doing okay and what it really takes to follow the rules and to do what you need to do and the payoff for doing what you need to do. So, you know, shout out to Bill Self and, and, you know, he doesn't know me from Adam, but wishing him the best of luck with, uh, with that journey. So I took that story in my head in a little bit different direction okay. because I thought about it from the mental health angle. And 
I'm a recovering trial lawyer. I'm also a recovering alcoholic. And I work with the State Bar of Texas um, Lawyers Assistance Program. So I know the mental health struggles of many lawyers, but I want people in the mm -hmm. compliance profession to understand that can happen to them just as easily. And that, they're, number one, uh, you need to take care of your own mental health. The ultimate end of the day, you're responsible for it. But there's still a wide variety of resources. And please reach out. Uh, for the longest time, I didn't reach out except to a bottle. And that brought a whole another set of problems to yeah. me. But um, it, from the mental health perspective, and we have some in our profession who are talking about their, they're talking about mental health. They're talking about the pressures compliance professionals are under uh, and a wide variety of other mental health issues that I think it's frankly high time that we in our profession really put on the front burner and talked about. So I want to um, shout out for, uh, I think Lisa Beth Lentini and her mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. is the one that uh, comes to my mind most, but a lot of people are talking about it. I know Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine talk about it on the Great Women in Compliance podcast. So uh, please take care of yourself, both as Jason said, from the physical perspective, but also from the mental health perspective. And if you need time off, take time off. If you need help, get help. Every company has an EAP program, uh, but there's a lot of us that I know in the compliance profession who are either like me in recovery, mm -hmm. or uh, that they have had issues that they needed help with, and we got help for it. Yeah, and and uh, uh, you know, they were for the grace. I didn't reach for bottle. I reached for pepperoni and cheesesteaks. Uh, but a lot of that was for the very you know I've learned was for uh, not not dissimilar reasons. Um, and I think. Uh, you know, he hasn't really talked about it. I'm, I'm projecting here, but I think, you know, Bill Self kind of set an example by saying, you know, look, physically, he was standing. He could have been on the sidelines. He didn't put himself on the sidelines. And that that self-care, you know, self-care was more important uh, than whatever additional points he might have brought to his team. And, and that is definitely, you know, the lesson. And, uh, you know, you mentioned you mentioned colleagues you admire. I'm going to give a shout out to Amy McDougal, uh, who's frequently a, a project partner of mine. We call each other our part nerds, uh, who has been doing uh, a lot of work and love speaking up about uh, self-care, uh, especially among veterans um, and uh, how that relates to their professional lives. Um, we always talk about the, air, the airline rule. The airline rule, you know, put on your own oxygen mask for helping others. Lawyers, HR professionals, ethics and blind professionals, we're, we're in the help of bringing others to serve, of serving others and helping others. We got to take care of ourselves first. And, and I love that lesson. So I'm going to ask you another question. I'm going to switch. I'm going to I'm going to put in a hard segue here and switch to a whole other topic. But it's it's one that's really been front of mind for me because I. Uh, it's a huge intersection of sports and, and the world of compliance to me. And that's that's diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and the whole DEI effort, and especially in higher education. And I just really feel uh, for colleges and universities who are, when it comes to DEI right now, you know, walking the tightrope. Um, I think, you know, most college administrators and leaders long since have come to a place where they're seeking diversity. It improves their recruitment. They believe it improves their communities. Uh, big corporate world has been there for a long time. Uh, no question about, I, I think, you know, where, where you'd find most companies' heart when it comes to DEI. But there are state schools, especially in the south, south especially in red states, who are facing enormous political pressure from a primary source of their funding uh, in the form of criticism of DEI. I mean, Florida is seeking to ban DEI programs at universities and ban DEI-related curriculum. Uh, in Texas, DEI is under criticism from the state, summer, uh, state government. 
Um, some universities and colleges in Texas are doing away with DEI and others are defending DEI. It's a tightrope. It's a goal that companies want, and yet it's under this political pressure. And, and to me, Tom, this debate feels like a debate at the core of ethics and compliance because this is an example of what are some core values. How many companies have the core values of you know, inclusivity, uh, diversion, uh, building community, and yet suddenly this is being thrown in the trash bin labeled woke? what's you know i'm in the northeast i'm in new jersey there is not quite the political division here that there is in the part of the country where you live what's this feel like and how's it feeling for compliance and ethics professionals you know in texas and the south to face this you know this shaking of the bedrock uh of core values so i grew up in a town that i went to segregated schools until high school mm -hmm. That was 1972, and we had segregated schools. That's the reality of the South. You don't have to scratch very far to get there. Uh, let me, and uh, I'll, I'll add, I grew up in Gainesville, Georgia. Uh, <laughs> my father was a newspaper editor, daily newspaper editor in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, uh, campaigning in favor of integration, uh, did not make me personally popular with several of the kids I went to school with, uh, got our share of threatening calls, um, on top of which I was the only Jewish kid in the school system for three years because my brother and sister uh, had gone to private school. Uh, so uh, been there with you, buddy. Uh, and it's just tough to see. So let me stick with Texas since I know that state the best. I know the governor. I practice law with the governor. And I don't think for a minute he's a racist. What he has said is, I don't like DEI, but I'm not a racist. So I'm going to be a little bit charitable and say, no, he's not a racist. What I think he is trying to do, in, in addition to pandering to a very base level of voters, they're trying to move from the I, the inclusion to affirmative action, back to 1964, 1968, affirmative action. And that's the diversity, that's all the diversity they'll allow is affirmative action, which means X number of percent get in. And the, they can't say we're not going to have diversity because then state schools will be in violation of federal law and they can't do that. So they cover it up by saying, oh, DEI is woke. But what they're missing is some of the things you alluded to that it actually makes whatever your organization is from a primary school to a secondary school to a higher school of higher education to a corporate organization it makes you better if you are inclusive. Number one, it's the addition of voices different than anybody's watching this on YouTube, seeing how we look, kind of old white guys. Um, but number two is inclusion doesn't mean simply having someone who looks different than us, sounds different than us, talks different than us, or thinks different than us. It is giving that person or those persons providing them a safe and trusting environment where they can raise their hand and speak up. And to me, that's what inclusion is. It's not simply affirmatively actioning, bringing in someone who looks different than me, but it is, okay, I'm, I'm going to listen to them and I'm going to take whatever counsel they may give me and I'm going to use that. And if I have that attitude, I as an employer will be better. I as a university will be better. And What's going to happen, I'm afraid in Texas, uh, I won't speak to what I think about Florida, but what I'm afraid is going to happen is Texas is going to lose that. They're going to lose those voices. They're going to look inward. And when you start looking inward and talk to the echo chamber, um, you get one voice. And that's not what is going to lead this state into the mid-century and beyond and states that 
do have inclusion uh, in their university systems will turn out better graduates and they will go to corporations that embrace inclusion and they will become better corporations uh, simply because people, even the old white guys, won't be afraid to raise their hand and speak up. So I sort of see it in that way. And if I can bring it back maybe even to some, some compliance issues, that's what a speak up culture is. It's creating a trusting environment while someone is willing to speak up. Yes, they may be a whistleblower and yes, they may be trying to stop illegal or, or unethical conduct, but may, they may be trying to improve the corporation or they may be trying to improve the business process. And that's what I see as the ultimate power of DEI the improvement of your organization, whatever that organization may be. Uh, that's an interesting perspective, Tom. And, and, you know, in part, it, it puts this debate in the context of what has been a more recurring challenge to the idea of ethics compliance, which is just short-term thinking versus long-term thinking, right? It's the short-termism, like I got to make numbers this quarter, right? We, you know, the, you know, used to be Mr. FCPA. You're still kind of Mr. FCPA. You know what's what 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 leads what leads to that kind of wrongdoing? What what leads to you know bribery and kickbacks? It's like I got to make my numbers this quarter, right? That's a short term thought, right? Short term win. I'm not worrying about the long term consequences. And I and I love how you have put the DEI debate kind of in the same framework, right? You might get some political popularity now. Uh, you might pander to the base right now. In the long term, this is not what leadership looks like, uh, and we're not going to get a result for it in the long term. I guess what concerns me about this uh, coming from the political sphere is, you know, this isn't talking about uh, what do we spend taxes on? How much do we tax you? Uh, you know, what are our budgetary priorities? Um it isn't even a debate over what are our core values. It is a debate about whether you're allowed to act on core values um, and and sort of dissing, diminishing, attacking the entire idea that we may use core values to drive what it is we do. And I think, you know, I, I, I am not... Uh, not everyone in the community agrees with me about this, but I think that the ethics and compliance community can't hide behind, oh, we don't want to deal with politics. Um, you know, my history included a long time living in the South. Uh, it also includes a mom who was born and grew up in Nazi Germany and who barely escaped. And there are a lot of business people and a lot of great business leaders uh, who spent time in Germany in the 20s and 30s going, ah, it's politics, uh, you know, I'll let them go, it'll fade. You know, sometimes it doesn't fade. And we're the people who understand the importance of core values. And there may come a point where we need to say, oh, this isn't about politics, this is about the bedrock. Uh, and I just feel for the people who are trying to lead these efforts at universities who are getting in both directions. So here's here's another place where this core values debate comes up, Tom, that that I'm going to relate to sports. OK, so we just in the last week had the Biden administration's first veto. And what it vetoed was uh, the following what was the ESG rule by the Labor Department. Just to explain this, right, the Labor Department in the Biden administration adopted a regulatory rule that said if you are managing retirement funds, it's okay if you look at ESG factors. That's not a per se violation of your fiduciary duty. If you evaluate investments in companies by that company's ESG performance as well as its pure economic performance. And Congress struck that using, uh, using its powers, attempted to strike down that rule. It wasn't that you have to, that, fund managers must look at ESG factors is that it was okay for them to choose to use ESG factors. Uh, the Biden administration has, has vetoed this overturning. Um, but here's where this, here's my sports comparison in this time. So I can bet on sports. I can pick up my phone and parlay all I want. I can bet on, you know, which player is going to make a three point shot 
next. I can just spend all the money I want on my phone betting on sports. And yet somehow I'm not allowed to choose to bet on ESG favoring companies. What? Well, I hate to once again bring up Puritans, but no gambling in the great state of Texas. I can't even bet on sites that are internet sites outside that are domicile outside of the state of Texas because we can't bet in the great state of Texas. So I'm protected from myself uh, <laughs> from betting. Now I can go to an Indian reservation and play poker. And we do a pair of mutual betting on horses, but uh, that's horse races, but that's it. So it will probably not surprise you to hear that I see ESG through a business process lens, given my discussion of DEI. And what I say to all those magnum hat wearing idiots is the following. What ESG does, it gives you, you, the corporation, either through a chief sustainability officer or a board or some committee, visibility across a wide variety of corporate issues that were not looked at uniformly previously. Whether you know you want to break it down to the E, the S, and the G, or whatever you want to call it, somebody is looking at business processes. And that when someone looks at business processes, it gives you the opportunity to improve those because you're looking at them through the lens of numbers. That's what the E in ESG is and what the SECs talked about in their scope one, scope two, scope three proposed regulations. Uh, and when you start looking at the numbers, that's when you can measure it. And if you can measure it, you can improve it and all those other things. So that ESG to me is essentially an enhanced business process. We have picked those letters to name it or moniker it. Uh, but within each of those letters, we are putting numbers around something that may not have had numbers around them before, but if there were numbers around it, they were siloed and the safety guy was looking at safety numbers. The compliance person was not looking at safety numbers, uh, nor were a wide variety of other corporate disciplines. So that, and if you move to G, that's governance. And so when you put all three of those together, uh, I think it can be a very powerful way to improve your business process. Yeah. And so I think it's appropriate to look at ESG and the market also seems to think this, whether the market is Absolutely. the investing market, whether it's institutional investors, hedge funds, private equity, whether it's banks lending money, whether it's insurance companies who are going to insure your risks. Um, so I've worked for 40 years in the energy industry and I still do legal work, uh, drafting contracts for subcontractors to go into, go into chemical plants or, energy processing plants, and there are now ESG requirements in every contract. Now, they're limited, perhaps, to the safety numbers and safety components, but they specifically uh, put that now in contracts, whether you're doing contract with Exxon, Shell, Citgo, Chevron, it doesn't matter. And this is exactly what I saw in the compliance field which was the real change came when the business model changed. And what happened once again in the energy industry is because that was the first FCPA industry sweep. The business response was to, we're going to put a compliance program in place and we're only going to do business with people that act compliance programs. And we're going to drive that all the way down the supply chain. Well, I'm seeing the same thing in ESG. ESG is not going away because it's such a powerful business tool. It makes sense from the business perspective. And if I can broaden this out to, once again, the great state of Texas has said, yeah, we yeah, are yeah. not going to put our money mm -hmm. with institutional investors uh, who look at ESG factors. Okay. You made a decision that you're not going to invest state pension funds in those institutional investors. So you're going to get a less rate of your return on your investment that's going to increase the taxes in the state of Texas. How brilliant is that? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, because guess what? Even energy companies are doing ESG because they see it in their self-interest. So I try to talk about ESG as a business process. And it's one of the factors that you can look at. Um, so that's sort of the way I try to 
Look at well, those I, things. You know, it's it, it it it's naive or futile of me to sort of expect consistent uh, <laughs> values based leadership from the United States Congress. Um, but it just it, you know, uh, I, I just got a flag for a minute, sort of like you know, okay, uh, uh, you know, liberty, freedom. Uh, the ability to make the choices I want to make. That's, you know, that's the American way. But you can't make the choice to go with a funds manager who likes, who follows ESG performance. You know, of all the choices, I'm denied. <laughs> You're denying me that one. Maybe not the model of sort of consistent values-based leadership. Just, just, just got to say. So before we leave, can you tell me the odds for Princeton to make it to the final four? Well, uh, I can't. I can't tell you the odds. I can tell you. Uh, I can tell you that I, I saw that they are ten point underdogs to Creighton in the Sweet Sixteen round. That uh, seems like you want to go with Princeton on the betting side. There, I think they're. I think they're a better team than that. Um, uh, there are a uh, hundred percent odds, uh, or close to hundred percent odds, that I'm going to treat myself and my son and I. Are going to be in Louisville and watch that game, uh, and uh, I know that it'll be a. I know that it'll be an exciting game. I know it'll be a close game, and and I guess the thing I would add for our purposes is, should I feel virtuous because I picked picked Princeton in my bracket, not because it was you know whether it's a good betting choice or not. Like it's the school I went to. Um, I, I got my alumni hat right here. Um, but here's the thing about Princeton and the success of the Ivy League in the tournament, because Ivy League's punched above its weight for several tournaments in a row here. Here's the thing about the Ivy League. There are no athletic scholarships. None. There's no fifth-year eligibility. In the COVID year, they didn't play. Not only didn't that play, the Ivy League did not grant players an extra year of eligibility. So the players on the Ivy League teams in uh, in the 2020 21 in the 2020 season basically took a gap year to avoid losing year of eligibility. They just you know they just, they lengthened their educational career for the sake of playing, and they didn't have scholarships. And yet the Ivy League team this year has beaten Arizona and beaten Missouri, and I kind of think they're going to beat Creighton. Uh, Pack you know Pack 12, uh, SEC, and uh, and uh, Big East, that would be a nice trifecta for an Ivy League team to pull off. So maybe you can root for Princeton because you're a fan of doing things the right way. What do you think? So the last time the an Ivy League sent a team to the Final Four was Penn in 1979, losing to Michigan State in the mm -hmm. semifinals. So uh, number two, the NCAA Finals will be held State, in Houston. I must add. You, have to, you, you yes. hold a degree from that fine that fine basketball institution. But the Final Four will be in Houston, so perhaps you will be in Houston seeing the Princeton Tigers. Uh, uh, here's an idea. I'll come knocking on your there, door because I'll need a place to go. stay. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I have stayed at the Princeton Club in New York City, so I have a personal connection uh, from that awesome. realm as well. And absolutely, you should feel righteous about your support of your Princeton Tigers. Thank you. Uh, I'm, if you don't mind, Tom, I'm going to wrap up with a way that we wrap up uh, the the uh, the Mindsets podcast, because uh, I'd love your thoughts about it, which is at the end of every podcast, we pick our compliance anthem of the week. And it's the you know, it's a song that can help compliance and, uh, and ethics professionals sort of like get get spirited up uh, for the work ahead. And I have heard several conversations uh especially in, in the coverage of the women's bracket uh, on CBS, I, I heard reporters and coaches talking about the song The Climb by Miley Cyrus. Um, uh, sometimes I'm going to have to lose. Ain't about how fast I get there. Ain't about what's waiting on the other side. It's The Climb and how inspiring they found it. And so I'm going to throw that out as our anthem of the week uh, to make a little sports connection in there. And uh, Tom, uh, fun as always to have this conversation with you. Well, let me see if I can pull this off. Okay.
So that was Won't Get Fooled Again by The Who. Oh, there you go. And I play it for two reasons. And the three. Number one, it's one of my favorite songs of all time. Great song. Number two, it was instrumental in Top Gun Maverick soundtrack. And the reason, uh, the third reason is that song has always meant a lot to me from a political perspective. Meet the new boss, boss. same as the old old boss. boss. And so as a compliance professional, please keep that in mind. Have professional skepticism. You don't have to be an auditor to have professional skepticism. But when the new boss comes in, make sure it's not the old boss and don't get fooled again. Right. And in the world of redemption, I might get fooled once, (laughs) but it's that second time that counts. Tom, I loved doing Ethics Madness with you again. Thanks so much for uh, for providing the platform and uh, for another great year. Um, If the if if the Houston Cougars are in the final four uh, and you have the pleasure of seeing that at home, I'll be thinking of you. And if the Princeton Tigers make it to the final four, I'm going to be looking for a couch. So here's why karma will put the Krugers in the final four, not simply because I picked them to win it. 40 years ago, Phi Slamma Jamma was one of the greatest college basketball teams ever and lost to North Carolina State. Uh, I think it's time for redemption for the University of Houston, and so that's why I'm taking them all the way to the finals. Good luck to you, man, except for the other team. Take care, everybody. That's a wrap. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. Thanks so much for listening to this special edition of the FCPA Compliance Report, Ethics Madness. I hope you'll subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever and whatever format you listen to it on. The award-winning FCPA Compliance Report is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.